morning, everyone. Yeah. All right, welcome to the BFI South Bank. Welcome to Future Film Labs. My name's Jari, and I have the great honor of being the Future Film Programmer here at the BFI South Bank. And what that means is that I spend my time trying to give events for young filmmakers, particularly those aged 16 to 25. And today, here at Labs, what we're going to be doing is hopefully something, talking about something that actually gives your filmmaking meaning. Because if a film is made and nobody sees it, did it? actually exist. <laughs> Do you see what I mean? All right, so that's kind of, you know, making sure that making films and then making sure that people see those films is surely the point of everything that we kind of do. So hopefully we're going to get a little bit of enlightenment into the whole process of how films get in front of audiences today from our wonderful panel, who I'll introduce shortly. First off, I've got a couple of things that I should let you know. Um, uh, now that you're here at the BFI South Bank, be sure to check out some of the other stuff that's going on um, in the building for you guys. So, like, if you've has anybody ever been to the Media Tech? Show of hands. Okay. Oh, there's a few. Good. Do you know what I mean? Enlightened individuals. Um, essentially, in the Media Tech, that is a way of accessing the, the digitized part of the BFI's archive. There are literally thousands of title, titles in there. Last time I checked, which is earlier this week, there were 33,000 titles, and there are more being added and digitized each week. And so if you want to kind of investigate all sorts of aspects of our life here in Britain, what, did, you know, what was it called to be wearing in May of 1973? Look it up, there's films about that. If you want to understand different genres of films, or the, how certain types of films have developed or what was happening, then there are tons and tons and tons of titles in there for you to check out entirely for free. Okay, so that's the first thing. If you haven't already, have you ever been to the, the BFI room in the library? Yeah, a few people have. Again, one of the biggest collections on film-related books and periodicals in the country. Um, and it's not just limited to the, the library that you see there, but there's also tons and tons of stuff in an archive, and they can order that stuff out for you, and they only charge a very nominal, I think it's like 20 pence a sheet to photocopy, photocopy stuff. So um, tons and tons of stuff if you're ever researching something, um, like loads of scripts, loads of books, all sorts of great stuff in there. So make sure you check it out. And obviously, if you haven't been to the shop here before, you can use your ticket for this event to get a 10% discount or something. Do you see what I mean? Christmas is coming. Maybe you can find something for the film lover in your life. I, guess. I, I don't know. But, um, I mean, or maybe a present for a hard-working uh, film programmer. I don't know. Do you know what I mean? Just suggestions. Okay. Um, Future Film Labs is all about kind of offering insight and inspiration for young filmmakers. All year we've been going through the process of how films get made. Uh, we started off with development all the way back in April. April, we were so young and naive. Um, and here we are. In December, December, can you believe it? Christmas is just around the corner, and we're talking about distribution today. Okay, so um, what we've done is assembled a panel of industry experts to demystify the process of film distribution. All right, so I want you to help me give them the warmest BFI South Bank welcome we can manage. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, from the far side, you know the end whistle. Dorothea, make some noise for Dorothea. And Ed Cameron as well, make some noise for Ed as well. Alright? You guys ready? Okay. Uh, there, there might be some clever stuff in there. Not from me, obviously, but you should, do you know what I mean? So pay attention, okay? There won't be a test, but I still want you to pay attention. Okay, let's do this. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's incredibly inconvenient for us to come on a Saturday morning. Um, uh, what I'd love to kind of get started with is a little understanding a little bit about how you came to do the jobs that you do and what the jobs you do actually entail. And do, do you mind if we start with you, Dorothea? No, no, absolutely. So, hi everyone, I'm Dorothea. I'm the marketing manager at Dogwoof. Um, if you're not familiar, it's a documentary distributor, international sales and production company. Um, 
I do, my job is to find out how we can connect uh, our documentary titles with audiences. This can be uh, done through marketing activities, but also through partnerships with, for example, the BFI Film Fund or corporate partnerships, um, great companies who give us money to do amazing stuff with cinemas. Um, so it's like a, a lot of like various activities, not just like purely marketing. Um, and on the side of that, because we are also producing films now, I'm in touch with filmmakers and help them to create the best assets like posters or trailers for festival uh, marketing and festival premieres. Um, so I work as a theatrical sales manager at Arrow Films. So it's my job to try and get cinemas to play our films. Um, and that can range from big multiplexes down to uh, community cinemas. Um, and I, I used to work in exhibition and then came across the distribution. So that's my background for getting there. Sure. Um, I work for Vertigo Releasing, we're an independent distributor and production company. Um, I work in acquisitions and development, so I find the films that we buy from third parties to release and also help develop some of our productions. Um, I got into what I do, I started off in documentary, got the job through an internship and then uh, moved across into features about three years ago. Okay, so I figure well, I'd love to kind of get started, just to help people understand a little bit about what you do. Each of you brought a trailer for us to kind of check out, and I'm just wondering if we, you know, if it, I think it'd be cool to watch those trailers so people kind of get an idea of the sorts of films you're kind of distributing and what that actually means, and then we can have a bit more of a chat, okay? So, um, yeah, let's, uh, I feel like, uh, let's run the VT. <laughs> Grateful beast. The town is going to be famous. The jump, the spins, the elevation. It was amazing. Sergei Kuluna. Youngest ever principal male dancer. He was so controversial. You've admitted in the past that you danced after taking to Kelly. The media pushed and pushed and pushed. He has quit the Royal Ballet. He just exploded. When I was little. I had such a passion. My family moved around the world to support me. That's when I guess fun was over. I would do well, like, twice more than normal because I knew that's my chance to get my family back together. Sergey, I think he's always suffered silently. His family was broken. I wasn't able to make everything good. He was thinking, what's the reason for me dancing? Did you feel like a prisoner to your body? It was the urge to dance. I just want like normal life. Um, oh. I didn't choose ballet. It's who I am. Was <laughs> that <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah
Gordito, I'm sorry that your son is not with you, but you know, you're a single man. You can do whatever you want to do. Drink up. <laughs>
they can be just on the strength of a promo that a sales agent will show. Um, so they can come from various points in development. Um, and then from there, you hope, if, if you bought the film before seeing the full film, <laughs> you hope it actually delivers on, uh, on what you bought. Yeah, it's very, very similar. So we mainly pick up from film festivals. We also have an international sales angle, so when we secure a deal, we secure the UK release for ourselves. But we also have a submission uh, page on our website where we encourage young filmmakers to submit their feature-length documentary. Um, and it's very, you know, it's, it's great for the acquisition team because we get always like fresh, um, fresh made uh, docs. Uh, it's around like 20 titles a week uh, that it's submitted uh, for us, so it's like a lot. Yeah. And we release 25 films a year in cinemas, so it's a, it's a big competition. Okay, and so do you think, um, you know, in terms of that early stage of maybe trying to talk to sales and acquisitions, and for young filmmakers, is it is the best idea to kind of get the film finished? Is it to promos to come try and talk to people while you're in the script stage, or like, what what would be your advice if for a young filmmaker who says, right, you know, what well, I would love more people to see my film. I think it's always advisable to get some kind of advice in script stage, yeah. um, and that can come from a variety of sources. I mean, some people might have an agent or not have an agent. You know, if you do speak to them about it, if you don't, if you have a script, that's a good opportunity to try and find one. Um, I would write to producers and distributors and sales agents that you respect and that you'd like to should be involved. Um, because a lot of the time, at script stage, there might be some elements that, if they're not changed, will just hinder the film in the long term that are kind of irrevocable. Just, can, you, can you think of an example of something that might, like, of a film that might, or an example of, a, of an element of a film that might do it, I, guess, I suppose. Well, if you, for instance, if you're making a film that uh, is primarily for a young audience, but is just has some incredibly violent, difficult sure. subject matter that'll make it an 18 cert, then that's going to make it extremely difficult to get distribution. Cool. I understand. All right. So, uh, understanding how content and audiences relate and how yeah. the whole kind of framework of kind of certification and what we use, what, you know, what types of things, rate at what points. Yeah, like, all, all, all of us who work at, in some relation to distribution, I mean what we do on a continual basis is get feedback from audiences about what they like and don't like in a very visceral, painful way. Like, <laughs> work or don't work. So, so we can, you know, I mean, it's not an exact science, but you can often read something and instantly have a feel for elements within that script that that audience will respond to or not respond to, and can kind of give feedback that might help you shape something that's a better fit for the kind of audience that you're going for. So in terms of you know building that experience, being able to understand films and, and audiences and how those relate, how have you guys actually, you know, what's your kind of, how have you kind of built that experience? because you know, you've started in exhibition and stuff like that, so how have you kind of built those kind of, uh, kind of muscles? Mostly through numbers. I mean, it's, it's not hard to, if you're working in a cinema in a certain region that has a predominantly senior audience, you know that senior films tend to work there better than films for younger people. So we always talk about what audience we're trying to reach. So if you can do that earlier in the process, it's, it's a good thing to give you a quick shorthand with be it sales agents, distributors, people like that. I think it's also important to actually show the film to the audience you're aiming for at the very early stage. We do a lot of like test screenings with the uh, primary and secondary target audiences. Um, and it sometimes it's even surprising for us because, you know, we are sitting in a London office and have an idea of the target audiences. And then we actually show the film to them and they say, well, that's not really working for us. Yeah. Or, or the opposite, oh my God, I love this film. And we rule them out at the very beginning. So I think it's very, you know, important to, to bring them on board, 
even in my post-production stage, um, and then, like ask, oh, is this actually you know something that you know like we can address to you? And then they say, yeah, I'm just you know really feel this film or not. So uh, it'd be interesting to talk a little bit about audiences and you know different types of audiences and how how you guys kind of think about audiences and you know when you think about like maybe you know, you talk about whether it's a senior primary and secondary target audiences. So how do you guys kind of, you know, when you're, you're thinking about sales and you're always constantly essentially building, how do you kind of define and think about audiences? Well, we always start with a with a brainstorm uh, process at the beginning when we acquire something. And it means that we define uh, or we identify a lot of like key facts at the beginning. So what is the comp titles similar to the film that we're actually working on. Um, we always do a SWOT analysis, which we like understand the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats around the film. And then based on these, we kind of like um, identify a primary uh, target audience. Those are the people who organically, organically really like your film and follow the project from the very beginning, engage with you on social media. And then we have also a secondary target audience, the people who would like to like open up uh, the film campaign through like other marketing activities. Um, and then, yeah, we just like, we know these uh, audiences and then we set up a box office uh, target based on them. Um, I mean, in a more, uh, I guess, in a general kind of way, I mean, a good way to think about audiences can often be, um, you know, just think about people you know and the kind of films that they like. And there are certain, um, there's, you know, there are quite distinct kind of, you know, there are people who like a lot of different kind of films, but for some reason they seem to be like older audiences have quite, you know, specific tastes in terms of, you know, they don't like films that are ultra-violent generally or that, you know, have deal with certain subject matter that they're not interested in. So if you're making a film for that audience, you kind of have to keep that in mind. Um, or, you know, if you're making a film that's for a more art house kind of audience, you know, they tend not to like um, genre stuff too much. So, like, art house boxing movies are really, like, just are continually difficult to distribute. They just are. Um, and so, kind of, I think looking at films that might be similar to what you're going to make and having a look at how they performed is a really good um, kind of litmus test for, for what kind of audience your film might have. And so, Pico, because I understand Arrow do quite a lot of sort of genre type yeah, of stuff, so um, how do you guys work with audiences? So, so that can be a shortcut, and like Ed said earlier, uh, distributors have egos. So, if you're if you know your film is is a horror film, you'd you'd do well to try and target uh, distributors that have had a history of doing that. Um, and flattery does always help um, because you can identify and say, uh, author Doug Ruff saw uh, Dancer. Dancer was incredible. Our documentary is of a similar nature and going down that route. Um, so, and I think. One thing with like Ed said of having those titles that you can uh, liken yourself to, it's it doesn't show that you're copying those films necessarily, but it does everything because no one's got enough time in the industry. Having any shortcut that you can helps. Okay, and so um, having a little bit of an understanding of how you guys think about audiences, it's. I'm kind of, I, I, I want to understand more about how you actually reach those audiences and how, the, the kind of ways in which you kind of go, oh, okay, right, well, this is a, a short enough film, so how would you talk to those, or, oh, this is, uh, you know, this is, like, Manash, like, how do you kind of work out, uh, how do you communicate <coughs> and get, make sure that the audience that would respond to a film like that, how do you make sure they know to kind of come out and do that? Well, with, what are the different ways in that one? With the title like Manash, it's actually quite straightforward because it is quite a niche film in many ways. So, um, one 
most of the audience for that film are going to be a regular cinema going audience. So we know that reaching them through cinemas, through you know, cinema mar in cinema marketing and trailer placement, all that kind of stuff is hugely important. It's a Jewish film, so there are certain areas of the country where, you know, North London, Manchester particularly, where there's a big audience that will be familiar with that subject matter and excited about it. Um, we actually got some BFI funding for that film to try and open it out. So You're welcome, by the way. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> to do with me. Yeah, yeah. But, um, but the one nice thing that that allowed us to do is, um, is target a slightly younger and wider audience than would usually go to see that film. So we've done a lot of digital marketing sure. around the film, um, which we've done very successfully <coughs> on films that are maybe more of a natural fit for that audience in the past. So it kind of, I mean, each film, you know, will have a different kind of footprint for that and different ways of kind of reaching that audience. But I think if you if you know who your audience is and you think about how they interact with media, you will very quickly get a kind of map for how you should be trying to reach them. Sure. So, for instance, if you're thinking, well, okay, uh, I've got a film that's for the YouTube generation, you'd be thinking about more online. Yeah, more kind of digital. Like, if you're talking yeah. about a, a film that can speak to a particular location and where yeah. you did work like that okay and so I suppose the genre stuff you'd think about maybe like you know horror blogs or yeah and if um, if you do have that audience in mind as independent distributors we have limited budgets uh, when it comes to our marketing spend so we have to be cleverer than some of the bigger distributors would be so if we can if we can target a specific audience it really helps us to spend that money better than we would if we were being able to just broadly reach as many people as possible. So it would be, say, horror fans might still be magazine readers, so you'd do in-print advertising, which you wouldn't do if you were trying to reach someone else. If you're going for an art house audience, you'd want to uh, advertise in broadsheets and things like that, which you wouldn't do with genre titles. Um, so that's that's something that we as distributors should have knowledge of, of, of how to spend that money. So it's just a case of being able to identify that audience. So uh, th th that kind of makes me think about how um, so a man, you know, young filmmakers, people kind of producing things, you know, obviously beyond the sort of technical filmmaking things, what's your story about? And how well did you actually execute this film? Um, I think, what what can young filmmakers do to kind of support what you do to make what they've got their film more attractive to you as you know, in sales or distribution? Is there things that they can do? In, you know, we've already talked about maybe kind of coming and having a chat at script stage. What else could they do? Well, I I'd, I'd say there's kind of two things that like especially when I'm thinking about very low budget films. Kind of key things that we would look at is, you know, if you can give someone something to market to, and especially if there's a, a specialist audience that would be interested in that. So, like something like Manash is very clear yeah. in that sense. We did a, uh, a low budget Irish comedy called The Young Offenders. Okay. Um, <coughs> super low budget, but what they did that was very clever was they made the film with a very unique local humor yeah. that resonated really well a particular Irish audience because it's something they never get represented in quite that way. Um, and so it had really strong value in Ireland, but then because it was quite funny, it traveled really well sure. as well. So I think kind of sometimes embracing what makes you unique and different and what gives you like a specialist audience is more important rather than trying to make something really broad and competing with bigger films in a way that is just not going to be possible. Sure. Um, and then the thing that I'm sure you get as well, the marketing elements is always hugely important and it's often a thing that people don't think about <coughs> until they're wrapped, but if you can just spend a day with your cast doing some nice photos that we can use for a poster, that will um, be amazing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so I mean, and obviously the opportunity to kind of get that sort of stuff done is when you've got all your actors together, yeah. right, when, you know, it's maybe much harder afterwards when they've all gone off to other jobs or whatever thinking about those sorts of things as you're going along can then prepare you for things like this later. 
that seems like a good tip. I don't know if anybody's making any notes. That seemed like one you should. Oh, that's like super important. Yeah. Like that's like number one. So when we acquire a film, the first thing you get from a distributor is a list of preliminary marketing assets that you need to provide. That includes um, a trailer, a poster artwork, if you have any, for um, cleared skills that we can use online and print, um, and also clips. I would say that um, you, when you start, you're not going to get a huge marketing budget. So, you know, save your money and do everything during uh, production and post production. I think a lot of people forget about that and they finish the film and they're so happy. And then they enter the film to a festival and then the festival sends them an email that, okay, this is what I need. And they're like, oh shit, now we need to create a poster and a trailer and we don't have any more money. Yeah. Um, so I think that's like very key for us. Yeah. And also I would say that set up um, social media channels very early and engage your primary target audiences. They're gonna be the most loyal audience um, you can have. And they, you know, they will be like following you through the process of making this film. And then they're gonna be like the core, like word of mouth. Um, source at the very beginning who go to like previous screenings and, and spread the word for free for your campaign. Yeah, do you have any thoughts on that, Heidi? No. Alright, well, yeah, yeah, well, I think yeah, the whole idea of, you know, you've got your, your actors in, your ca in character, in costume, in hair and makeup, that seems like a great opportunity to get those images that will help people to kind of um, sell or promote your film. And that's a great opportunity and then you know, the idea of maybe kind of setting aside a little bit of time in the during the shoot while you've got everything there seems to be a kind of a, a really like a, a kind of a, a little bit of low hanging fruit in terms of a filmmaker preparing themselves for succeeding. Do you know what I mean? Assume assuming assume that people will want to see your film yeah. and prepare for that point possibility. And also just like I think uh, one more key asset that sometimes people forget is yourselves. So as a director, uh, you are one of the key assets you can have for your own campaign. I'm talking about we do a lot of like uh, previous screenings and Q and A's with directors or uh, the subject of the documentaries we work with. Sure. I think dancer is a really key example of how we manage to work with uh, the talent from a film. Um, to create this live event uh, targeting the primary audience who were the ballet uh, and opera fans. In the UK, uh, all these like live events are very successful in terms of the box office numbers, so like uh, National Theatre or Royal Opera broadcasts. So we knew that we needed Sergei's contribution to make this, uh, to raise this film to a level we wanted to see. And because Sergei contributed, we all get the, the multiplex support, which was also very rare. Um, usually they don't program films, um, which are available day and date in theaters and digital platforms. That's kind of a rule that the multiplexes operate. They only program content, which are only exclusively available in cinema. Sure. So we wanted to have like an extra element that we can offer to audio and view uh, and all the all the flexes, and we couldn't do that without Sergey, but he was very kind and he just joined the dance amazingly. So. Wow, cool. And I suppose uh, you know, we always get to this point where I, I'm, I guess people kind of want to know this: it's understanding the deals that you guys do, you know what I mean, and how money works. And I, it's ugly talking about money, <laughs> but like, if there isn't any, if there's anybody who doesn't care about this stuff and we want to move on. Right, but do you want to know how these sort of deals work? Yeah. Where's yeah. the money going? Yeah. See, I know you guys. You know what I mean? They want me to show them the money, right? All right. So, how do how do distribution deals, how do sales deals work? You know what I mean? I think this is the sort of stuff that people are really kind of wanting to hear. Well, probably the most important first step is getting a sales agent, um, who usually represent the rights internationally for you for a percentage of whatever they sell it. Um, and they'll help you do distribution deals, which can be complicated and difficult if you haven't done it before. Um, and What's a fair percentage? If you, the sales agent comes to you and you say, you know, we like your film, we'll take a percentage. Um, do you know what I mean? I help these guys to be hard-nosed, <laughs> hard-nosed business people. Huh? Well, if you're getting interest in your film, I mean, you should try and get four or five companies to make you an offer. Ah. And then weigh up what is the best because the, the 
fees can range massively depending on what a sales agent thinks they're likely to get back, basically. Get them pay a minimum guarantee. Um, I think so that's what does that mean? That's a good, this is a term I've heard before. What do you mean when you say minimum guarantee? Um, it's just um, like a contribution from the sales agent saying that um, I know your title will work yeah. and I invest in it in advance. Yeah. Oh, so um, that's a, a guaranteed yeah. minimum amount of money yeah, you put in. that you get paid up front. Yeah, yeah. Oh, so right. it's a flat fee. Oh, right. So it actually is yeah. literally what it says on the tip. Yeah. 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 A minimum guarantee yeah. of So you will get money. that money for sure. Yeah. And I think it's important because later the sales agent can't tell you that, oh, sorry, your firm is not working. We can't make any sales. So here you go. I'm giving it back to you. Yeah. They're going to say, shit, we invested this MG already. So we need to make sales. Okay. So that's um, not a, a guarantee of the money they'll spend to promote the film, no. but the money they'll give you for the film. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's the good stuff right there. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Guaranteed minimum. All right. So then, um, so then, what happens next? So you, you take them. You've got a few people interested in your film. So you're starting. You know, you're going. Okay, you're trying to get um, uh, maybe a different people interested. Well, so what's the etiquette about it? Because it seems a little bit. I don't want to say slutty. <laughs> that seems like the wrong term. But kind of. But sales just, agents will be used to that. Yeah. Just yeah. Like, Seems unfair though, you know, don't you? You give up, you butter them up, we really love your work. Not so much that we'll give it just to you, but we'll go and talk to other people. So how do you how do you navigate that as a filmmaker? Um, I think I think you can be quite transparent that you're yeah. speaking to a number of people because essentially your job is to find someone who will give you a decent amount of front with decent fees and who also seems really committed yeah. to selling the film. I mean that's quite an important part that I yeah. think people don't always think about is try and get a good feel for how committed that agency seems to the film and how it ranks in their lineup because that's going to be hugely important to how much effort goes in when they bring it to market. So, like, <laughs> <laughs> so, like what, so what sort of things should we be looking for? So you're talking to a sales agent and you're thinking, okay, yeah. what, what are the clues that they might, that for commitment mm. and other clues that might kind of give away that they're not... You'll They're feel it a lot of the time in communication. Sure. How many times are they in touch? Are they calling me? Are they, you know, do they seem quite keen? You know, have they not responded for five days? Yeah, you know, yeah. those kind of elements will give you a feel for how much that person wants your film and how much they're under pressure to get it, essentially. And what other films they have. Yeah. yeah because if you in inquire about what else they're working on, because they might give you a, a list of hundreds of titles and then you kind of think, well, maybe they were offering me a better deal, but are we ever going to get the film sold when it's in a lineup of all of these films? Mm -hmm. So, weigh that up as well. Yeah. I would say, like, do your research really mm -hmm. well, yeah. uh, but don't forget that it's uh, it's based on trust, so you should like the people you're going to work in the next year or so, yeah. um, and you should trust those people. I think sometimes it's hard for our filmmakers because a film is essentially their baby, sure. and they're gonna give, bring it to someone else. They come on board and say all these terms like MG and yeah, this poster is shit. We should change that, and the target audience is different. And you think, oh, maybe you know they are not the right fit. But essentially, they are doing that for you know a lot of titles for like many many years. So you you get them on board because of their expertise in the field. Yeah. So I would say like trust them and we really feel when the filmmaker really trusts us and it's like a joy working with them. Okay, so be nice to people but also be a bit yeah. firm though, <laughs> yeah, in yeah. terms of what it is that you're looking for. So um, just, and, and, and forgive my ignorance for not knowing this sort of stuff, um, but like, so when you talk about like the fees, so you know, so what sort of things would sales as, what, what sort of fees come up, you know, where does that what sort of things they charge you for, or how does that work? Um, well, it, it can vary differently. I think it's, it can be quite different across docs and, and features. Um, so, I mean, typically what you'll have is there's like a percentage they'll take for sales, yeah. which I think can be anything from 10 to 30 percent, depending on who the company are, how big the title is, what the sales estimates are. Um, and then a lot of companies will have um, expenses they'll charge for going to 
markets, if, if you're doing a deal with that, make sure there's a cap that's at a reasonable level. <laughs> that sounds like a good tip. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the expenses <laughs> sounds like some real insider information that was one hard one. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, usually it'll be an additional 5% or something like that across the year that they can spend on expenses. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then, uh, and so what sort of things, and what does a sales agent do? What sort of things do they do to actually help sell, sell your film? Are they, 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 they the ones that take it to the festivals? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, and it's usually quite a good idea to have them on board before you. So if you get into Sundance and get into South by Southwest, it's usually good to have someone on board before you go there. Yeah. Because they'll generally have a marketing person who will help generate PR at the festival. They'll help you with artwork. They'll help position you so that when you go there, Journalists are going to see your film. You know, there's a kind of excitement and a buzz that you can then leverage to kind of go into distribution out of your premiere. Yeah. So um, taking advantage of that whole idea of how a sales agent can sit on the festivals is important. Can I just say that if you get into a festival without a sales agent, you did an amazing job. Mm -hmm. and well, um, what, even the Future Film Festival? Because it's really hard. Um, we have a festival uh, manager, Luke, um, who has the biggest Excel sheet I've ever seen. That's all the festivals in the world and all the programmers who program for those festivals. And not just like, oh, this is like a, you know, like a nature dog festival in the Netherlands, but also like this, this programmer really liked this like three, three other titles. And he's like, you know, hiking mountains in his free time. So he's going to be wow. the person who programs this film and gets into the festival. Okay, and so they are like on a daily basis in touch with them. And some sales agents and distributors have a really good established brand. So if we talk to Sundance and they say, oh, it's, it's a dog book title, yeah. let's watch this. Let's give it a chance to this title. And I think that's very nice. Yeah. And this is, this is how the sales agent helps yeah. uh, to a filmmaker to get into those... those uh, it's, it's like any business, You, if you have a successful working partnership with a company, you'll keep on going back and back. So that's that's another thing to find out with sales agents is see who they regularly work with. Um, I mean, there's some companies that you instantly, if, if a sales agent gets in touch, you'll respond quickly and you'll have regular meetings and discussions, whereas some others you might not at all. And it might just be a one-off sometime if you do, or you might just go and see them at a certain market. So f find that out as well. Research is everything. So, um, okay, so I, I mentioned I, I wanted to talk to about if we can't kind of catch the eye of sales agents, things like that, um, we, we kind of have to go it alone. What would be your tips for helping people develop an audience and um, kind of get a film out there. Is there, you know, is there, is there anything that you think of that's maybe, you know, like people are, well, this isn't quite right for us, but why don't you try this? Do you ever think those sorts of things? It, it is tricky because a lot of the time, if if you haven't got a sales agent, the cynical side of distribution thinks there's probably a reason why you haven't got a sales agent. So it's it's rare that you would that we would pick up a film without a sales agent but that could it could be down to uh, a producer that someone's worked with in the past so you're bypassing the sales agent because there's already a relationship there or to try and get some kind of a champion for the film if you don't have a sales agent that can give you that shortcut because if if you do get a film submitted out of the blue with we're cynical, so it's it's rare that that's gonna that that's not just gonna be put to one side. How many films do you guys reckon? How many films do you reckon you've watched this year? Just <laughs> 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 a hell of a lot. Yeah, it, it must be hundreds. Yeah. Yeah. Wow, like, like, do you know what I mean? So, do you reckon what, like, what, two, three, a day? Um, how do you how do you actually fit it all? Well, I mean, if, if, minutes of time, how do you feel? If, if I'm at a festival, I'm usually watching four or five films a day. Wow. Um, and then 
I guess, in the office of watching four or five films a week, probably, and then um, that's just for work, and then I will go in my evening and weekend to watch other films. <laughs> 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 yeah, sometimes people are like, oh, do you want to go to the cinema and watch something? I'm like, no. <laughs> <laughs> I, I really don't. But so I I've seen them all. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's important, we are talking here about distribution, and it's important to understand the market. Um, so, it's just last year, altogether in the UK, uh, more than 900 titles were released in well, cinemas. So 900 is the number that actually made it to distribution and theatrical distribution. And that includes event cinema as well. And out of this 900, the top, top 10 films, obviously studio releases, took more than 80 something percent of the whole box office. So, you know, that means that the other 890 titles shared 20% uh, of the whole box office revenue, which is like a crazy number. And then if you go to the BFI website, you can read very depressing statistics about like <laughs> people go to cinemas 2.7 times a year. So you have 900 contents and 2.7 times that people actually go to the cinema and you wonder what you need to do that your film is like, you know, standing out and this is why I think this is like the core essence of understanding the audience because you need to find those key people who you know like pay for your pay for your title within that 2.7 times they go to the cinema yeah, that's good stuff. I wanted to have a uh, before we go does anybody have any questions will you have some questions yeah all right hold on wait till <laughs> I'll just before I want to get into one last thing so Obviously, you know, we talked a lot about theatrical distribution, but obviously there's been a real kind of revolution over the last decade in terms of what ways in which people can watch films, you know, in terms of, you know, you think about the digital platforms and all that sort of stuff. So how has that kind of factored into what you do and, and changed things? Um, I mean, uh, for us, to be honest, theatrical is still the main driver. Um, what we often find is that if something doesn't have that profile and that shop window, then that massively decreases the home end potential, basically. Yeah. Um, I think because there is so much content, especially because TV is so strong at the minute, um, you, you need something that's strong enough to be released theatrically and, and that people feel is a, a real film, I guess, quote unquote, um, to, for someone to go, to go onto iTunes or, you know, whatever platform they're on, I go, actually, I'll give that sure. a go. Um, so it's still it's still a really important part of what we do. Um, and in terms of digital, what I would say is, I mean, it's very easy to get your film available to buy there. Um, but because there is such a huge selection of content, what's become increasingly important is you know, it's that old thing of shelf space, but it's just moved online. You know, if you're on the iTunes homepage, you're going to sell well. If you're not, you're probably not going to sell very yeah. much at all. So if you are looking at a digital campaign, you've kind of got to have a strategy for how you're going to make people aware of the film. Um, because if you're a smaller title, whatever space you get there is probably going to be quite limited. So you've got to find a way to channel people through other ways to your film. It's an amazing the amount of films I hear about, and I think... And people say it's on Netflix. They'd be like, well, I've got Netflix. I didn't see that. And you put it in the search window, it's there. Yeah. But, like, you know, it's you never see it. And I remember, you know, I opened up Netflix and it says there were 66 titles added this week. You know, you might, you know, you know so mm -hmm. that whole idea of how, you know, I suppose you need, it can't just be, oh, we got it on Netflix. You need something else to make sure that people know that it's actually there to go and find it. So, and, and so is that the same for, like, the documentaries and for children films that you're finding? That it doesn't make. I think it's very important again to approach this question from the audience perspective. So think about like what is the film's target audience? How they consume films? Do they go to the cinema or are they like couch potatoes who always pay for their films on iTunes? Because that's really important to match the distribution model yeah. with the actual film and the target audiences. So because our titles have like super small budgets and and you really like, you know, tailor make our campaign. Uh, for us, it's like we do a lot of like day and date release with theatrical 
visual and digital, I would say it comes at 50-50 from our percentage. But sometimes we only go for digital, um, and then we release the film in like one, two key um, cinemas around London. And I think it's called platform release, and it's really important because um, in the way that you're putting the film in cinemas for like a few shows, that helps you generate uh, really good press reviews that, you know, like, Journalists will go and watch the film, they give you rating and stars, and also there is like an additional social media buzz. If you just release it uh, on iTunes um, immediately, you would not get this like, buzz um, online. And we actually see the numbers in sales when we have like a few Q&As with the directors or Q&A with talent, uh, day and date with digital, that really helps. Do you find that? Is that Digital will have make a big difference for the genre. Yeah, it, it's. I guess it, again, it's it's knowing knowing as much as possible before going in. If you're if you have your heart set on having a theatrical release, you'd you'd insist that with the sales agent, who would then insist it with the distributor. But if you do that, you might limit the opportunities you've got to sell the film. Or if if you if you were more open to it being. Uh, straight to DVD or straight to digital, that might cheapen the film. Um, so you really have to think your, yourselves as well how you would want the film to get out there. And when it is low budget, you also have to think from the audience perspective, how many people are going to pay £15 to go and watch this film in the cinema on the opening weekend? Because the cinema is becoming more and more expensive. and those bigger films are taking up more of the market, so you really have to think how, how much you want to fight for that and what impact that could potentially have on you as well. I guess the other thing that we should probably discuss is we're talking about it from a kind of business point of view, but I think for a lot of first-time filmmakers, what is an important element is their first film as a calling card. It's yeah. something to get the next film, it's something to give them profile, and what I've seen a lot of good young filmmakers do recently is they have a good film, it's not quite big enough to justify one of us getting involved, but it's something that will get good reviews, that will garner some kind of interest, um, and so they self-distribute, essentially. So, so that sounds interesting. Yeah. Uh, now, it's not an easy thing to do, yeah. but essentially what you have to do is you have a good film, you write to journalists, you write to cinemas, you try and get people like Claire Benz from Picture House, or and cinemas or you, you try and just approach all of those channels directly and say listen we know we're not a classical theatrical release but we'd like a couple of shows over a week enough that we can have a national press show and we can get a few critics in and we can just create enough of an awareness that then when I'm writing to agents or producers or financiers I can go well look at these great reviews that my first film got and it was a small film but this shows that I've got something and that when we, you know, you're going into a conversation having that track record, having something that you can say, I can do comedy or action, whatever it is on a small scale, if you give me a budget and we develop something together, I can actually work with actors and I can execute something. And, sure. and that's valuable. You might not make your money back, but it gives you something to, to sell. It sounds good stuff. All right. I think it's time for any of your questions. Okay. So there's a, there's a mic there. Some if, if a hand's gone up, all right, let's see what we can do. Let's get one in. Yes, you were on the um, You've given us some invaluable information um, regarding feature films, um, but I just wanted to ask what your experience is or do you have any with um, short films? Because um, you mentioned about obviously films being calling cards, but quite often when you are starting out, um, I don't know what the, the statistics are, but um, I imagine a lot of people start off with shorter films rather than feature films. Um, so if you have any um, info or you know anybody who kind of deals with that, do you have any advice that you can give us with regards to distribution on that side? Um, well, from my experience, I think with short films, it seems to be mainly festivals and uh, online. So if you can get any kind of traction on YouTube or Vimeo, um, that tends to help. Um, and it's a lot of the time short films can be a good way to get an agent who will then go and rep you, um, you know, to try and get you a feature, essentially. Sure. 
So that could be the same with uh, sales agents as well. The more the more of your work you've got to show, if it is short film, then the more someone's going to be willing to work with you. And it's a short film can be a calling card in the same way that a feature can. But there are less commercial opportunities for a short film, so you would be doing festivals and things like that. Uh, sometimes I see this um, release model where a short film is attached to a feature film. So you go to the cinema and um, instead of starting with a feature film, you watch a short before. Well, controversial, wasn't there a and short a Pixar movie that just had a, a short in front of it that people were really, really upset about. Uh, Coco and fr Frozen for in front of Coco. Coco, mm. yes, yeah. Coco Pete, though. Well, they asked about it. So, but that works sometimes, yeah? Yeah, it's definitely. And I think it's a, like, a nice surprise. Uh, and it, again, like, helps you raise awareness and get to know people in the industry. I think connections are really important. So, yeah, use it as like a, as a business card to get into the offices of, you know, programmers and journalists and, and film festivals. And there are, there are companies that, again, it's about doing research. People like Film London always promote short films or the VFI will. So there, there will be specific programs put on where you could get your short film on that if you go to that. So just find those organizations. Sure. Okay. All right, we've got another question. The arm's gone up. There's a mic coming. We'll get. I've seen, I've seen the hand down there, you guys. Don't worry. Hello. Um, how important is it to you to have a sort of known cast, but known lead actors? That's a good question. How important? Um, uh, it depends on the genre a lot of the time, but it makes a massive difference. It makes a huge difference. Um, just, I mean, just in terms of marketing and promoting the film, especially if that cast is willing to support, uh, it, can, it can be, it, it can radically change the prospects, basically. Yeah. But is it better to say, for instance, if you're, if you're, yeah, we're talking about like kind of low budget kind of films, okay, so obviously if you can get Michael Fassbender to be your film, <laughs> well, it doesn't, I guess, just, I mean, you'll definitely get anybody, regardless of what else happens after that, I suppose you'll get people's attention. But would, if you, is it useful to maybe cast someone who's not necessarily known as an actor but is well known? To, would that help, or if you can get like a, a musician or a, it can a YouTube star yeah, or something can, like that? It can do, yeah. Okay, so it's, it doesn't necessarily just have to be an A-list. It's certainly worked for, for films like uh, Brotherhood, for example, having someone like Stormzy in there. That yep. was something that raised the profile of the film to a different audience, or uh, it was quite simple. But yeah, you, you can have that sometimes, especially with musicians. Um, it, it does, look, like I was saying, it's no one has enough time, so <coughs> having a cast is a quick shorthand as well that you can, that works for us as salespeople, um, but it's not always key. It's something like God's Own Country has done incredible this year with a cast that wasn't very well known, but the actors really got involved with the release of the film, so that made a huge difference. I think it's very important that when you do the contract with the cast that you include that they need to support the afterlife of the film. I think that's something like, you know, they contribute and then they're like, oh, sorry, I can't do the premiere, I can't do interviews. Um, so yeah, it's just a nice contribution. Okay, that's cool. We have a question down here. Um, you were talking about making sure you do a lot of research on sales agents who what their contacts are and um what what sort of i mean other than google what's the best way to do that sort of research and find out that kind of who who they're meeting and who they're who that whose ear I, they have i think if you read a lot of like screen screen international they always press release um all the news happening what i personally uh i, I, I love as a source of my research is um the BFI published all these like informations about like case studies that have happened before. Um, because I, I'm not from the UK, so when I came here first, it was really hard for me to understand the British audience and like, oh, where do we find them? Um, especially regionally. So I looked up all these case studies where they, you know, identified their audiences and then the partnerships they did and all the companies they worked with. And it's all available. 
um, online. So it's like amazing reports where you can just like read about like business models, what other people did. And then you can compare those to like, you know, box office numbers and like figure out like, oh, this actually really worked for this title. Um, so yeah, that, that's another good source. Just to plug it, do you remember, does anybody remember when we um, did a load of stuff around the film called The Weekend back in the last year? Do you remember that? There's a BFI case study about how that film um, got distributed and, you know, and how that whole worked. So yeah, there's definitely a thing, and particularly, you know, we had Sheridan in talking about that particular budget and it, that particular film and its budget and how they actually realised it. And so you can actually check some of the other stuff against that if that's something you wanted to research. Also, re reach out to people that have been in a situation similar to yourselves because everyone's been through it, so a lot of the time you will get people that do want to help other people as well because they know how hard it was for them starting out. Um, so I'd go down that route as well. Yeah, you remember Rob Savage? Does anybody know Rob Savage? Comes here and does a lot of events with us. He's just got a feature deal. Why don't you all email him? <laughs> <laughs> Tell him I said yeah. <laughs> there you go. So let's blow up his inbox. All right, let's get one more question in before we run. There's some hands going up there. Yeah, hello. Um, I'm Sarah. I'm from Croatia. Maybe it's a stupid question and everyone knows that, but I don't know. How do you find an agent? How do you find an agent? <laughs> um, well, they've all got websites with their kind of details as to who their clients are, and you just drop them a line, basically, and just say, this is who I am. This is my short film or my feature or my script. Would you take a look? And you know they're all desperate to find the next, you know, Christopher Nolan or whoever it is. So yeah. you know that's their job is to, is to look at new talent. So. Um, well, I'm sure if I'm at home, then I see hundreds of websites. <laughs> <laughs> well, the big ones are independent talent, United Agents, Casarotto. Um, if you look up, um, every key festival has a market as well where the business is happening yeah. and they have this kind of like speed dating model between yeah. filmmakers and sales agents or filmmakers and distributors. That's literally the scariest thing I've yeah. ever been to. It's like meeting 100 people a day and you constantly have to pitch your film. But because it's really, really unique is that you have the chance to meet people in person and face to face is like the most valuable um, way to like stand out from the crowd because they must get like, I don't know, I get like 50 emails a day about that and I don't even work in acquisition. What's, what's so, interesting to follow up on that is that, say for instance, like if you were doing documentaries, um, I'd say Dogfest. Yeah, yeah they, but they, they, if you're an official kind of um, delegate at Dogfest, you get this big, thick book, and it's literally got everybody who's at the market listed, and sometimes it's got like you know their picture and lots of information about them. But even if you don't get to go to the festival, maybe you can get a look at the book to maybe do some research to find agents that might be interested <coughs> in the sort of thing that you do. So there's lots of different ways that you can find info. And don't forget to go to all the parties because I find that if you go to parties where there's like drinks and you know yeah. you might meet someone 3 a.m. in Sheffield that happens a lot actually yeah. and then people you know just ask a business card and then you can drop an email to them the next day saying hey guys it was very nice you know chatting to you over the third secular and this is the film I was talking about and can I follow up with another you know screener it's, it's the same thing if you manage to get your short into festivals, do travel with it, because yeah. you will meet so many people, and there are so many people talent hunting on that circuit. Yeah. All right, okay, let's do one more, and then we've really got to move on. So one more question, let's get, yeah, you got it. Do uh, sales agents and distributors often get involved at script level with first-time filmmakers, and if so, which ones are more prone to it than others? Which ones wow. That's some specific stuff. <laughs> do you have their email address? <laughs> it's it's a lot rarer yeah. um, because because there's a lot of films in the market. There's only so much screen space, digital space. Um, th you will get less people willing to take a risk. Um, so that's where having a short film, having having another 
piece of work for someone to go off really does help. Okay. All right. Well, look, I know there are hands going up, and I appreciate that, but do you know what? It's a finite amount of time. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Um, and we've well overrun it. So, look, at this point in time, can I get you to join me in thanking our guests today? All right. So,